So now that we have talked about what typically happens in a plagiarism hearing, today let's discuss, as students, what can we do in order to best prepare for such a hearing. But first, of course, a quick disclaimer here. Different universities and colleges do things a little bit differently. What I am talking about here is just general information, and it is certainly not legal advice. So, what can students do in order to best prepare for plagiarism hearings or academic misconduct hearings in general? First, it is a good idea for you to talk to students who have experienced such a hearing in your faculty. Ask them exactly what happened in the hearing, who were present in the hearing, and what kind of people were they? What is the exact process? What did you guys talk about? What were the questions that they asked of you? You would want to know exactly what to expect. It is going to be a somewhat tense situation, so you do not want surprises. Learn as much as you can about how your faculty does these hearings, so that you know what to expect. But at the same time, however, still stay flexible and be prepared for surprises, because there will probably be some. Second, prepare your defense. Whether you admit or deny the allegation, it is likely to your benefit if you could present some good defense. Now, of course, this would depend on the situation. I mean, if you have committed serious plagiarism, if you plagiarized your entire literature review chapter of your dissertation, then probably no amount of defense is going to get you out of it. However, if your case is not that clear-cut, if things are rather ambiguous and can go either way, then a good defense really matters. Look, I am not advocating here that wrongdoing and mistakes should not be held accountable. But the thing is, sometimes there could be a little bit of ambiguity when it comes to plagiarism. Plagiarism comes in different degrees, and as such, the consequences and the penalties should also vary. For instance, if a student plagiarized his entire literature review chapter in the thesis, then of course this is very serious, so the consequences and the penalties should also be very serious. But if the issue is just one referencing mistake, or it's just one sentence which should have been paraphrased and it wasn't, these things still, by definition, are plagiarism, but they're much less severe. So probably the consequences should also be less severe. After all, plagiarism can be intentional and serious, or it could just be a genuine mistake on the part of the author. If we're talking about one paraphrasing issue of just one sentence in a 20,000 word dissertation, okay, that is still plagiarism and it should be corrected. But most likely, that is an unintentional error. There still should be accountability, but the punishment should not be disproportionate. So what I am saying here is that if your plagiarism is not the most serious and you do have some genuine extenuating or mitigating circumstances, then it would be very useful for you to present a good defense, because that might lessen the severity of the punishment which you will ultimately receive. The exam committee typically has a whole range of sanctions and punishments to choose from, ranging between a warning and deducting some points to termination of registration, so expulsion. So even if you committed plagiarism and you admitted to it, you can still strive to present a good defense in order to receive a more lenient form of punishment. Third, bring your evidence and defense or justifications on paper so that it can be officially submitted to the committee. As an example, let's say I've been accused of plagiarism because there is a section in my literature review, a couple of sentences, which I did not carefully paraphrase and I also did not properly cite and reference. So this is probably not the worst kind of plagiarism, but it's still pretty bad. But if I were able to show to the exam committee my various previous drafts, saying, look, in this initial draft, I already highlighted all the direct quotes and I wanted to paraphrase them one by one. And then I was going to add all the citations and references carefully. I knew how these things worked and look, I was making very good progress. I was doing everything properly. And as you can see in this later draft, everything was paraphrased, everything was cited and referenced, so I was making good progress. But somehow, probably because I was changing the formatting of the paper, a couple of the sentences which were highlighted, indicating that I still needed to paraphrase them, somehow the highlighting just got lost. So I missed these two sentences. It was my mistake. I'm sorry about that, and I'm going to correct this. But believe me, it really wasn't my intention to plagiarize. Now, in this way, the student might actually convince the exam committee that although this person did commit plagiarism, it was really not intentional. So very likely, the exam committee will rule that plagiarism was committed, but most likely, they are going to choose a rather lenient form of sanction. Next suggestion, so number four. Ask for the decision and the rationale for the decision on paper and everything else relevant to the decision on paper. Now, this is something that probably your exam committee already does automatically. 
But if I were a student and I paid tuition fee to my university and somehow the university is going to punish me, even though it is for a mistake that I made, I still want to have proper explanations on paper. This is important not just for the sake of record keeping. This is going to be crucial if I were to want to appeal against the decision made by this committee. So ask for everything on paper. Next point. So number five, appeal. If, in your view, their decision, their ruling, and the penalty that they have determined are truly unfair, you can appeal. Again, detailed regulations may differ per jurisdiction, but in general, a student is always entitled to appeal. Of course, just because you appeal, that doesn't mean you're going to get your way, but you could at least try. Sometimes you appeal back to this committee by providing them with new evidence and new arguments and ask them to reconsider. In other cases, you appeal to a different committee. In the university where I am currently employed, and according to the laws and regulations for the jurisdiction in which we are situated, students don't appeal back to the same committee, but they appeal to a different committee. In our system, the exam committee is a faculty-level body, but the appeal committee is actually on the university level. And as such, this appeal board is actually more neutral. Because this appeal board does not belong to any particular faculty, they stand above all the faculties, and they make their independent rulings. So as a student, when there is this appeal mechanism, you might very well use it. And this is exactly where all the record keeping comes into play. If you are able to show, through all those records that you kept, if the exam committee somehow deviated from the standards or the rules, or if they made a procedural error somewhere, or if they did something that is demonstrably wrong, then you might stand a very good chance of having the appeal board overruling the previous decision. In addition, in many cases, you do not necessarily need the appeal board to overrule the entire decision of the exam committee. All you want to have them change is the penalty. So your argument might very well be the exam committee was correct in their decision, but the sanction that they have decided to administer is too harsh. So my only objective is to get the appeal board to give me a less severe punishment. Again, just because I appeal, it doesn't mean I'm going to get my way. The appeal board might very well uphold the decision made by the lower level exam committee, but at least I get to try it. And in many jurisdictions, the appeal board's decision can still be appealed. In our system, you can actually appeal against the decision made by the university appeal board to the higher education tribunal. So there are always actions that you can potentially take. But look, the point is this. Every time we appeal against something, it takes time, resources, energy, and probably money. So at some point, we have to ask ourselves, is this still worth it to appeal? Or is it actually easier to actually just take the punishment and be done with it? So there is a balance to be found there. Finally, number six, I'd like to briefly talk about hiring an attorney. You could consider hiring an attorney to be your advocate or representative. But here, the policies and regulations of different universities differ greatly. Some universities do not allow students to have an advocate at all, so the student would have to represent himself or herself. Other universities do allow for the student to bring an advocate to the hearing. However, they require that the advocate must be an internal person. In other words, it can be a student who is registered at the university, or it can be a staff member or a faculty member, but it has to be somebody from within the university. And some other universities do not have any requirements at all, so you can bring an advocate to the hearing. And this advocate could be anybody. It could be a fellow student, or a faculty member, or an attorney that you hired. So obviously the policies and regulations differ greatly. But even for those universities or colleges which do not allow you to have an attorney with you, hiring an attorney is still very useful, because this attorney could help you behind the scenes. For instance, earlier we talked about preparing a good defense. Well, how to prepare a good defense? Obviously, we do not want to prepare a defense poorly, so ultimately the defense actually harms me more than it benefits me. So the advice of the attorney could be very useful in the process of preparing a good defense. We also talked about appeal, and this is yet another area where the services of the attorney could be very helpful. There is another thing to keep in mind. Maybe in the initial hearing, your faculty's exam committee does not allow you to have an attorney present. But the appeal hearing might be very different. Because very likely, the appeal hearing is with a different committee, and this different committee might have different rules and regulations. Maybe in the exam hearing, you couldn't have an attorney present, but in this appeal hearing, maybe you can. So I would suggest having an attorney is a good idea if you can afford one, and if the case is a high-stake case. 
And let me also very briefly touch on this. There are some people who are quite critical of this whole process of plagiarism hearing and student misconduct hearing in universities, describing such a hearing as a joke, a farce, or a kangaroo court. Now, some of the arguments which underlie their criticism actually may not be completely illegitimate. So this may be yet another reason to hire an attorney so that one can better ensure one's rights are safeguarded. Did I forget anything important? Leave your thoughts and comments down below. And if your comment is a good one, then people will like it and upvote it and everybody will see it. So leave a comment. All right, as always, thanks for watching this Randy Ways Random video. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.